Okay, so uh, how's everyone been doing? Woo! COVID's been tough. Uh, I'm going to give a bit of an unexpected kind of talk. It's not going to be exactly what I usually do, but we're going to go through it. Who's seen one of my talks before? Knows what I'm doing? Who does not? Who's seen my stuff? If you haven't, just raise your hand so I seem really popular. Um, I don't know. I use the same jokes. Uh, hopefully, new code, but same jokes. Um, yeah. It's the best thing to do. So, I've been working on MGMT for a while, too long, and I really want to talk about what's left because I do really want to finish this to a good MVP state so we can start taking over the world. Um, you've seen these videos from me from Montreal. I'll leave that for another time. Uh, I'm a hacker. I work on config management. I read a technical blog of James. I've not been blogging so much recently because I've been super busy with life and all sorts of things. Um, I work for this company now, uh, which is good because I'm not homeless, but I uh, haven't had as much time to work on MGMT lately, so I'm sorry for that. But just to be super clear, um, these are all my opinions. Uh, I work with a bunch of lawyers, and uh, yeah, definitely not their opinions, and especially the bad jokes are mine. Um, so just some background, um, everything was kind of like bad and terrible in the infrastructure industry in my point of view when I started. Uh, you know, now everything's all YAML, which I think is just terrible. Uh, do we want to be YAML engineers? No. I don't want to be, because uh, you're just kind of writing some code, and like I said, uh, I'll show you the note guy, because I like the note guy. Is the audio okay? Yeah. I hope this, for the stream it's okay? Yeah. Yeah, so this is my note guy. Um, like I said, I'd, I'd rather spend time writing code than redoing slides. So all the same jokes, all the same images. It's been three years, you forgot, right? <laughs> Don't be shy. Who's shy? Let me know so I can pick on you. Raise your hand. Okay. So I wrote this thing called MGMT, um, engine language. I'm not going to go through all this. I just have it in the slides to, to fly through. You, you probably know what it, it, it does and how it does it, roughly. Um, if not, there's lots of recorded talks and blog posts and whatever. It does all this cool stuff in parallel. Um, guess how many resources whoops, we have now in MGMT? What? So we actually have 33, which is kind of crazy. The last time I gave a talk is 27. So um, it's kind of like unexpected. I didn't think so. Uh, this is just a bit about the language that I want to use to, to describe systems. Um, and um, the, the truth is, um, if my super slide loads, um, this is sort of like how I saw MGMT. We're like climbing this big hill and I'm feeling really good about things, but like there's some fail going on. Um, and, and the truth is, this is where the talk kind of changes a little bit. Um, I think for many reasons, this is all, for now, mostly being a failure because it's not finished and it's not, um, it's not something I'm really personally using in production very much. Um, and, and there's reasons for that, and I'm going to talk about that, and what's next. Uh, and so that's a little bit what it's going to be. But I know you would all be super disappointed if I didn't show some demos. So I'm going to show you, if you want, and you give me a huge round of applause, some cool demos. Yeah! Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think I'm known for demoing. So just uh, some hard stuff. If you haven't seen the, the easy stuff before, you're going to have to, I'm assuming, some knowledge here. But we can write some code like this. Uh, like we're basically creating a file resource. Uh, let me just uh, go over here to my terminal. I just compiled a fresh version of MGMT, and I'm going to run uh, this code here. Uh, so MGMT is running here on the left, and if I go here, uh, I have uh, this file whole one that gets created. Okay, and the cool thing, so MGMT is I've been told make this file out of a bunch of other fragments, uh, individual fragments that I enumerate, as you can see in, in the slides here. Uh, but also a directory of files. And all this code is on GitHub, so you don't have to, you can try these at home. But the really cool thing about this is, let's say I remove this file. You saw MGMT, it woke up and said, whoa, something has happened. So I remove the file, cat the file, it's right back. Remove the file, cat the file, it's right back. This is not puppet speed, this is like lightning speed. And you can even go remove the whole file and cat the file, and just before it even finishes, the file is back. Is that big enough for everyone to see in the back? Don't be shy. Yeah, I'll make it one bigger. There you go. So remove the file, cat the file. Um, and even if you do sort of running this whole thing in a loop, a for loop, uh, like this, um, it's actually removing the file really quick um, and putting it back sort of in real time. It's super, super fast. Um, and it can get way faster, but that's another talk. Um, by the way, this is like super dev environment. So if this crashes, uh, there's still a lot of things going on, which I'm talking about. Um, as a fun little side note, 
I have this directory frags in here, and these are the three files that make up that, that big thing here. But if you actually, uh, three of them are managed. If I say, hey, config management, tcamp, echo foo into this foo file, and now I actually uh, cat this file here, uh, in the parent directory, you'll see it, it pulled it in, right? So the whole thing is super live and dynamic. And you can choose to manage those files or just pull random files from a directory. The design is up to you, but the capabilities are there. Does that make sense? Yes. Who's really confused? Um, that's okay. Uh, I don't want to go too much into demos. I want to show you other stuff. Uh, just a really cool thing that I like. Uh, this is what I call reversible resources. Um, so I'm just going to run MGMT here. And over here, um, I have... Where was the file that I created? Um, I make this file hello. So I say, oop, that's on purpose, don't worry. So, um, oh, there's a file, abracadabra. And just to make this super obvious, I'm just gonna cat hello so you can see what's happening. So the file's not there, it's there. Four seconds later, abracadabra, it's gone. We wave our magic hands and the file comes back. Boom, right? And it'll just do this all day long because the code looks like this. Uh, you want to see the code? Yeah. Uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, reverse. Oh, it actually opened in the right window. So just to show you, MGMT is real-time streams of stuff in a DSL. Uh, the gentleman in the previous talk who said DSLs were not the way forward, I disagree. Um, and, and basically what I've done is have this stream of seconds, right? The number of seconds in the year. And if it's divisible by four, uh, this variable down here uh, becomes true. Uh, sorry, this variable right here becomes true or false. So what we're actually doing, if you're familiar from in Puppet, we're normally just declaring this resource here. I have a file, it has some content, state exists. But everyone remembers from the Puppet days, you define that in your catalog, it runs on the machine, but then you edit your puppet code to get rid of that, and it's still there, right? It's now just an unmanaged file. But that's so silly, you don't clean up after yourself. Um, so just by putting this metaparameter reverse right here, by, by making this line of code disappear from your, from your MGMT uh, code, it says, oh, how do I get rid of this thing that I previously created, even though this is no longer defined in the code? And that's why the file disappears and then reappears, because I'm just flip-flopping it back and forth. Does that make sense? Yes. It's, it's super, so I have, I've actually failed another way because this is all pretty abstract. You haven't seen real world examples where these features uh, are killer, but they are there. Sorry for the people hiding behind the podium. Um, they are there and we're gonna build real world examples sooner. So um, that's just to hopefully just get you remembering about what we can do uh, when I finish this stupid thing. Cool? Who's asleep? Do I have to throw more fire at you? Uh, do you want to see another demo or should I stop and do the boring stuff? Demo. Come on, come on. Do you want to see a demo or do you want to see some boring stuff? Boring <laughs> stuff. Okay, so the cool thing about having real-time resources is we can build non-traditional resources that Puppet and Terraform could never build. Or, uh, none of these are possible in those tools because they don't think about real-time and modeling time. So one of them you can actually build, for all things, a TFTP resource. So I have here at the top, uh, I'm defining a TFTP server, and then any number of TFTP files, um, which will all get grouped into that server and literally build a TFTP server on the fly. So let's do a demo of that. Um, P. So that's this one. So I'm running this TFTP code, and, and MGMT, it's a single Golang binary. It has a, you know, a TFTP library that imports, wraps it with some MGMT stuff to make it into a resource. And then over here, I have just a random TFTP client. Um, I just, it's in code, MGMT, examples, TFTP. Um, so this is literally just a standard Golang um, TFTP client, and I can just make a request to some file. I'll make this super obvious. MGMT is literally sleeping. The kernel has put it to sleep. And then all of a sudden a request comes in, Boom, on the right, it made a request to MGMT. So I've now programmatically, in the DSL, in the same one that I use to manage all of my stuff, built a TFTP server. 
Now, why on earth would I want a TFTP server inside of MGMT? It's a programmatic TFTP server that I can turn on and off and put files into and take out of and do all sorts of stuff dynamically in real time. Why would I want that? Pixie boot. Pixie boot. Pixie boot. Okay, and what's Pixie boot for everyone else? Come on, let's put the real world case. I heard someone who's been talking to me. So yeah, you can just run different files. Uh, it does the thing. Um, so if you want, so basically, oops, uh, if you want, you can actually build a whole Pixie server and an HTTP server and a DHCP server and put all of these pieces together. And now you have a single binary that you run on your laptop, plug a uh, switch into the Ethernet port, and you can bootstrap an entire data center. Right? This is actually a thing that I've wanted to do in Puppet for years. Uh, how do we get this thing going? Um, you're making, oh, I'm doing a bad job of talking into the mic, sorry. Uh, all right. Uh, so, do you want to see a real live demo? Yes. <laughs> if they don't say it loudly, I'm not going to do it. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, we got one person. Who wants to see a real live demo on someone else's production infrastructure? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now we're talking. So, um, is it the US one? I cannot answer that question. <laughs> so, oh no. Uh, I have to restart Firefox. That's super annoying. Wait, here is Excuse the Firefox bug. I have like a thousand tabs open. This might take a while. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, no. This is what I've been doing. Yeah, this is stupid. I have a lot of tabs open. All right, maybe we got Firefox open. Okay. You know, whoever works on Firefox, like, don't make me restart my browser ever. I'll do it when I want to. Okay, so I have just an SSH tunnel here uh, to some random server. Um, and from that, I'm connecting to a SIP phone. And we have to go over here. Um, this is just some free PBX server that's running MGMT. Um, and I hope they don't mind, but I'm going to just, so I'm just going to, I killed it normally, I'm just going to run MGMT on that server. And what it's doing, it has some very simple code that has a DHCP server, an HTTP server, and Pixie server, all defined with MCL. And so it just started up, uh, and it turns out if you look here, these are a bunch of uh, TFTP files for each MAC address of each phone. I'm going to hide the numbers. Uh, let's see if this phone is going to wake up. These super crappy phones that... Uh, are kind of slow. There's my password, don't tell anyone. So in theory, uh, if I go here and restart this phone, once this thing loads, come on, it's a phone, there we go. We reboot the phone, I think this will actually cause it to re-provision. So the phone is going to reboot, it's going to come up, it's going to get a DHCP and all this stuff from MGMT. MGMT is going to say, oh, a phone, this is cool. Uh, and you should see it do some stuff uh, here in this uh, window. In a moment. This is a bit of a slow demo, so I'm going to let it cook on the side. And uh, if, I, if it doesn't come back, my, fr my friend is not going to have his phone. Just actually kill this so it fits in the terminal nicely. Um, it should work, probably works. It worked to set up all the phones. And so this is just a static example because I have a list of static phones and whatever. But um, you can do this um, you know, really program programmatically. And when you have your server come up and boot, uh, it can send a message to the MG MGMT cluster, hey, I'm up, I'm awake, uh, we're basically building a distributed state machine, uh, do cool things, provision more infrastructure, MGMT could eventually copy itself over to those new servers and continue doing that thing. And you go home with your laptop and your new data center has just been rolled out or a started rollout. So this is the future. How do we build these things, right? Um, who's ever bootstrapped a data center? Um, I heard that a big cloud company has uh, to do this a lot, and I heard it's really complicated. Um, like, it takes, you know, many, many people. But if we write all of our code really, really well, um, any single one of you could, given enough hardware, build a data center of your own software side, like, completely automatically. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, oh, and so that's going to do its thing. Let's go on a little bit. So um, in the meantime, while this loads, um, the, I wanted to really talk about all of my failures because I've made a lot of failures on this journey, and I think it's good to talk about them 
Um, and you know, it's too bad I made them, but here we are. So the first thing I did is I spent way too many time, way too much time on resources and functions, like those built-ins to MGMT that suck in data and do the work. Um, less or simple functions, the, the bats, it took a lot of time, but I did learn a lot about MGMT and it really helped me flesh out the design. Uh, and I don't think I could have done that any other way, but I probably should have done fewer. Um, similar things, I added a lot of features into the engine, metaparameters, reversibility, all these cool things that I was really experimenting with, because I was having fun doing it. And that was like motivation that I needed. But uh, from a MVP as the priority point of view, I definitely went on course a lot. Um, I even was playing with GPIOs and, and boards and having MGMT do the input-output stuff of electronics, which is really cool, and there's so much potential. Uh, but yeah, it took too long. Um, this is the major thing that really, like with COVID and a lot of things going on, um, implementing lambdas. So the language itself is an FRP type language, so a functional reactive programming language, DSL. Uh, let's see if this, uh, hey, there you go. You can see actually that's the TFTP server at the, at the start. Um, it's reading the phone stuff, so this is actually working. Phew, <laughs> you can clap if you want. Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to come. Basically, the phones boot up. They get a language file to see what language they should be in. English, French, all sorts of other things, the configuration. Who's, who's run a SIP server before? You know what I'm talking about, right? If not, ask them. It'll keep doing its thing. Um, that's a real phone in, in Montreal. So, uh, Yeah, so the, the truth is, we want to build really cool things in the language, <coughs> but we don't want to make it so that you can accidentally write dangerous code. Because if we have dangerous code, like if you write all of your infrastructure code in any programming language that's Turing complete, basically, what is the risk? You make a small software bug, an off by one error, and that off by one error is a data center that gets like undeployed, right? Um, if you've done any infrastructure tooling, you've made these mistakes. Um, the difference is MGMT is going to undeploy your data center at 10 times or 100 times the speed that Puppet or anything else ever did, right? Imagine you're running Terraform, they have Terraform plan because they're afraid to nuke all your stuff because it's likely to happen. Um, and this is not the way to, to, to go fast. We don't want to constantly plan, look at it. Humans are going to make mistakes anyways. So instead, my approach is we, be, we build a really safe language that lets you describe things uh, in, in a, again, a safe way. And that's how we model infrastructure. And to do that without for loops, we need something called lambdas. Basically little anonymous functions, uh, things like MapReduce where you pass a function into that. And it turns out those are like crazy hard to implement. And I am just not smart enough. I am not a compiler's author. I'm a physiologist that got sucked into writing code for all you people. And uh, yeah, it's hard. Like even, I looked early programming language authors like from the before I was born time, they didn't implement lambdas either. And I know why. Uh, it's super hard. Um, thankfully, I have a friend, uh, Sam, who's a genius, who's been helping me implement this. Uh, but we definitely need help. So if you actually have Golang and compiler skills, this is a very hard problem. But if we solve it, the benefits are good. Um, business stuff. I had some interest from investors and people that are like wanting to get in early doing MGMT stuff. And I just really wasn't adult enough to understand this problem, uh, how to talk to them. Like I, I'm just too nerd and no business skills. And this idea scares me. So, you know, I didn't know who I should be partnering with, if I should or shouldn't. I was just happy writing my code. Um, I care about the tech. Like, I want to pay my bills because uh, I bought a condo. It's super expensive. Interest rates are crazy. Um, but that's not what motivates me. My, motiv my motivation is about building cool stuff and changing the world that way. So, um, yeah, this was dumb. Every other person I know is like, oh, yeah, investors, VC, done. And I'm just, I never learned how to do that. So this is probably a failure in some way. Um, concurrency bugs are super hard in Golang. I've gotten a lot better at them, but sometimes I get really tunnel vision on some of them. Uh, so there's actually um, a bug in the uh, resource engine, um, which is still unfixed. It happens very rarely, but it does happen. And uh, I don't know how to kill it yet. I have a plan. Uh, the engine is super complicated, and in fact, my first bit of code that I ever wrote was that engine to prove that the design of MGMT would work. But that code was super bad because I was super new at Golang. So I rewrote it, and the new version is better, but it has this bug. Whoops. Um, and funny enough, the old version actually never crashed, but it was yucky, and 
Long story short, I'm stepping back. I have a new library that I'm writing that handles the concurrency stuff. And so I'm solving that smaller problem, and then I'm going to use that library to solve this bigger problem. So I think it's going to be okay. But it really, you know, it's really frustrating when you're stuck on this bug and you're working mostly alone on these really hard problems. <clears throat> so uh, another fail. Uh, Built-in etcd. So I really wanted to have like true bootstrapping, and part of that is etcd. So how do you set up Kubernetes? I don't know. Someone sets up etcd. Hopefully, it just keeps working while you set up Kubernetes. And from time to time, you manually manage it to add and grow nodes, right? Is this what everyone does for Kube? Yes or no? Who's got a real autonomous distributed etcd setup managed at the moment? You're lying. Uh, if you're not, you should tell me why. Most people are just using uh, Amazon or Google to manage their etcd for them. True autonomous like etcd that's running itself and growing and shrinking as hosts uh, come and die, I think is pretty, pretty rare. Um, and I wanted to build this in the core so that bootstrapping the uh, MGMT that depends on that CD, uh, which we build into the code base, is automatic. Um, it's buggy. My implementation is buggy. My algorithm is good. And the kind of ironic thing is that the MGMT DSL is designed to solve these kind of problems. So for now, I'm punting on the problem. I'm doing exactly what Kubernetes does, which says, if you have to have an NCD cluster, <coughs> point Kubernetes at that. And that's our kind of answer for now. In the future, we'll either implement this properly in Golang, or um, we'll do it in MCL, the DSL, and go from there. So that's something that took way too much time. I rewrote this at least once. Um, yeah. Uh, living off my savings. Like, I was at Red Hat. I took two, two and a half years after that just to work on MGMT while my money went down. Like, you can see by my choice of clothes. I'm not wearing, like, fancy Versace and stuff like that. But life is expensive. And, uh, yeah. Like, I really enjoyed doing it, but it's not sustainable. And it's especially sustainable. It's especially not sustainable um, because there's a lot of stuff to do. And, I don't know. I like the idea of funding and building MGMT, but I don't like the idea that so many people that seem to want MGMT uh, aren't there funding it and helping build it. People in open source, and this is a really big unsolved problem for many people, very few people want to fund open source, whether that's companies or individuals, um, and, and even fewer want to actually invest in something that's not already giving them value. Right? So pre-MVP, almost no one participates. Almost zero. Um, and that, I think, is really disappointing because it's not the world that I would like, I don't think any of us would like to live in, but here we are. So, sorry it's not done yet, but uh, briefcases of suitcase, suitcases of money are welcome. Um, marketing sales, all these things, like convincing higher up execs at companies to fund things like this, uh, not my skill. Um, I've had a lot of support, but like really selling, doing that like C-level type conversation, I don't know how to do this. I'm just a hacker. So um, everyone that has kind of advocated on my behalf, talk to their bosses or whatever, saying, hey, we should invest in this. Like, you have my blessing. Please go and nerd away from me. I told you this is going to be a boring talk. It's not my usual day. Uh, conference talks. I probably gave too many conference talks, to be honest. So I'm going to basically put that to zero, except for config management camp. And if I don't have lambdas working by next year, I think I'm going to be in big trouble. So that's the goal, to finish that, and hopefully a lot more next year in Ghent. And we're hopefully not going to have any more COVIDs. Deal? Yeah. Thank cool. you. Um, yeah, this is sort of what I was talking about before. Like, you know, I've always been a big free software believer. I'm running Linux. Um, you know, I avoided having an Android smartphone until just this year. I'm trying to do the right thing, but it's super hard to do, especially like when you're building something that's really complicated. Um, if it was just a small little tool, but it's a really a huge tool, right? It's basically something the size of Puppet and bigger and more complicated and faster uh, from scratch. And uh, it's not easy. So um, we can all do better here. Um, yeah, I hope. Um, so why are uh, some of these things so hard? Do you want to hear a bit about why these problems are actually, from a technical point of view, very hard? Yes. I think it's kind of interesting. It, it was an expensive lesson. Um, so lambdas are super hard. So if you actually write some normal MGMT code and you have every language feature you want except for lambdas, what you end up getting is you get, you get a uh, graph that looks something like this. So the engine, the compiler, uh, sorry, the compiler generates a, a graph, a DAG, which you're all familiar with, um, and you can actually see the flow of values 
through that uh, function graph. So this is some math function that just is a silly function that calls 42. Here's a string. These both go into a printf, and that gets called. Like the graphs are very simple, um, and they're static. And static means the shape of the graph, right? How many vertices, how many edges, and the relationships stays put once the code is compiled. Um, and this is just you know this trivial two lines of code that generates this particular graph. But a slightly um, bigger graph might look like this. This is a medium graph. And here, if you try and see what the code looks like, um, you can see you have an int going into this variable. We call the plus operator on that variable, plus these other two things. I mean, you can go through it. It's uh, not super fun, but this is what actually MGMT is building in the compiler behind the scenes to run this FRP. Uh, it's cool stuff. But the shape of the graphs does not change. And here, this might seem complex. Uh, I can't even zoom in right here to show you. Bless you. Uh, but this is this is actually turns out to be a very small program, um, and but this was still okay. The graphs, you know, you can look at little parcels of them, little small parts of them. Um, they get enormous for any reasonable sized program. You know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of vertices and edges, but the shape doesn't change. But it turns out, if you want to do lambdas properly, when the lambdas are running the actual structure and shape of the graph changes in real time. And it turns out building all this was super hard um, because this whole thing is running and passing values through it and then at any point, any of those vertices can say, oh, I think I would like to add four new neighbors and have these edges point to me. Uh, it's really not fun. Um, and poor little physiologist me has to write this code. So yeah, not good. Um, this is why it took so long. It was really a daunting problem. And I didn't realize that this was the problem for at least some number of months in when I had the implementation that was so close and starting to kind of produce results, except for some of the edge cases, and then I realized something was wrong. And then I started asking more questions about, oh, and then I realized that to restructure a good part of the code. So it's very complicated. Um, and, and we're not even doing all of the complexity. So in a really cool world, we could actually have streams of functions that we pass to resources and those resources could then use those dynamically built functions. That doesn't sound sensible right now, but it's a really good idea. But that's super hard to do as well. So that probably won't be in the MVP, but one day um, it'll be very powerful. Make sense? Yeah. Uh, resource engine, again, I told you a bit about the concurrency stuff. Um, I rewrote this. Um, it's uh, in good shape now. Uh, with this new library I'm writing, I think this will be a solved problem. So that, that's coming. That won't block me, hopefully, for too longer. Um, the HCD stuff, I, I talked to you about this as well. Um, this bootstrapping problem is really very difficult. Um, if you think you really are solving it or like solving this kind of problem, uh, come talk to me, and I'll point out some edge cases in how you didn't solve it uh, properly. Or maybe you did solve this perfectly, and if you do have an implementation for this, I'd love to use it, but I, I don't think it really exists. Um, I know this because some very big tech companies that have all of the money and engineers that they could want uh, are not able to solve this problem. Uh, not in an elegant way, let's say. So um, the, the companies that, that run NCD for you, I believe, I don't have any personal knowledge on this, but if you check, I'm pretty sure they just have a centralized system that is coordinating, right? And so this is not a true distributed system support. This is an orchestration approach, not a configuration management distributed systems approach, the way I think the world needs to be built. Um, otherwise, if it doesn't, you're always going to have one super big company running the whole thing. And do we want that? I don't want that. Um, so uh, let's see how we are for time. Uh, I think we're not doing pretty good, actually. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of future work. Lambdas are the first big thing that I absolutely have to kill. Um, this requires a new function engine. Uh, which I've started writing, and hopefully I'll finish pretty soon. Um, the same code that I actually use, so instead of actually writing the code kind of in line almost, I've actually stepped back and said, okay, it's so hard to write this code, so instead I'm writing a small library that implements just random uh, asynchronous uh, size and shape changing DAGs, and then I'm going to use that library to implement the function engine. So this is my idea. I think it's going to work, actually. I've been feeling pretty promising about it. It uh, makes it easier to reason about the small parts. And uh, you know, I'd love your help if you're good at Golang concurrency. Um, 
I also really need a good time management solution because uh, paying my bills and working for a day job uh, takes a lot of time. Uh, they're a very demanding company to work for and I put in probably way more hours than I should and even if you do that it's not always uh, healthy or you know they don't double your salary when you put in twice the work. Um, so I need to solve this problem. I'm not really sure how I can solve this problem but still, as, as long as I still have a mortgage and as long as these interest rates are at six and a half percent or how they went up like crazy, I'm kind of stuck here. So I'm going to work as much as I can, but I don't have the funds to stop doing day job. It's just, you know. Um, and sometimes, uh, motivationally, it's super hard to get this work done. Especially, especially when you're writing like some really arcane code that's super tricky and you know not many people in the world know how to do this well. Um, it can be very challenging to find motivation to like revisit that code and and step through it and debugging it and figuring out what that little bug is. So um, any help on the code side uh, or, or what have you is super appreciated. But we're gonna get Lambda's done and you're gonna be super impressed. Um, how can you help? These are kind of template slides but I've totally changed this up because uh, I had kind of more frivolous like, you know, hack on this, like silly ideas from previous talks if you've seen them. Uh, we really need help. Like if we want to build this, uh, we need help pre-MVP. Um, I don't know what you should do. Like, if you have suggestions, take it upon yourself to to figure out if you have funding or your company has funding to hire a Golang developer to help finish this with me. Uh, I will mentor them. Um, if you have a company that would like to hire me, I would love to work for your company. Uh, particularly if uh, you want to pay me a certain percent of the time to work on MGMT, because uh, that would be pretty cool. So um, you know, just in general, if you have a company and you want to hire me, let me know. Uh, help them implement the compiler. Uh, compilers are so hard. Uh, engine concurrency stuff is super hard. Um, but if you help do these things, you'll be you'll be famous. <laughs> You're gonna be like, yeah, I wrote this part of the engine, and people are gonna be like, oh yeah, that's the MGMT engine guy. Stupid purple idea couldn't do it, but you did it. Uh, that could be a good CV thing, right? Um, and honestly, I think the principle of hacking on things that you want and that you believe in is really valuable. Um, there's a lot of people that I've found that I see the work they do and they're motivated by what they believe is missing in the free software ecosystem. And I really look up to that. So if you really want uh, certain things, vote with your feet and help um, contribute to the projects that you uh, want to support. And I really encourage you to think you know, as architects, think uh, from a technical point of view, what things are missing, and look for those projects led by people you believe in or ideas that you believe in um, that are going to build the future tech that you want to see, whether it's in GNOME, whether it's in infrastructure, whether it's in accounting software, whatever that is, try and vote with your feet and be involved, um, even if you're giving someone 100 bucks a month, because uh, I know you're all rich software developers, so you can definitely afford that, right? And if you're not, uh, let's talk. You should, you're underpaid. Um, so let's just recap. Let me recap. And while we're here, let's just check out this TFTP thing some more. So you can see the TFTP thing is still doing its its job. Wait, where is it? That's not it. That's this one. Uh, my SSH connection died. <laughs> let's go onto screen. Yeah, you can actually see it in screen right here. Oh, don't reboot it. Um, so you can see here, actually, just that demo from before, uh, it went and downloaded all the, the ring files and whatnot, so this is all working great. Uh, which is great, because the phone means, phone's back to working. So, um, I'm still on Lavera on IRC and MGMT config. There's not too much activity, but that's sort of what I've been keeping as the dev hub if you just want to casually chat about stuff. I have a mailing list, which when I do releases and other stuff, or if you have questions, I watch and send to. Uh, there's Twitter still, I guess. Like, I don't know what we should be doing. Like, where are people hanging out on Slack, on Telegram, on Instagram? Like, I don't know, honestly. If there's a better place than IRC, like, scream it out. Matrix. Matrix. <laughs> so let's improve these slides. <laughs> Matrix. <laughs> Discord. Not Discord. What else? What? Like I don't, I don't really know what the the right place is to have an MGMT community, but it's um, I guess it's important to meet your community where they where they are. And I don't think IRC, sadly, and I've tried, believe me, I've tried, 
is where most of the people are. Um, so if you have suggestions, please let me know. Somebody think about it. I really would prefer it not to be Slack or Instagram. Um, so yeah. Um, there's my blog if you want to see some old articles. There's lots of talks that really go into a lot of the engine features and language features and so on. I'm a Purple Idea on IRC. I have Mastodon, uh, GitHub, Gmail, Twitter, Purple Idea, just ping me. I don't usually bite. Um, on Wednesday, I'm going to have a workshop, and it's not really going to be a formal workshop. I'm going to be there hacking, probably building my uh, DAG engine library if no one else is there. But if you want to just hack on some stuff, uh, ask questions, uh, let me know. Um, this is just in response to uh, me doing stupid fire tricks. Uh, if you want a sticker, uh, let me know. I will give you some stickers if you come up here at the corner. Um, and if you really like this talk, please take five seconds and DDoS Chris and Roshan for doing such a good job in the talk. So, yeah, thank you so much and happy happy. So I think I have a few time, a few minutes for questions, if anyone would like to ask a question. Um, I love a little bit of back and forth. How long do we have? Uh, you have until one. Okay, so we got we got a good time. I mean, I want to go get lunch before all of you, but if you want to ask a question, don't be shy. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, do you consider some form of crowdfunding initiative? Uh, the gentleman asks if I've considered crowdfunding. Um, I have briefly, but I'm afraid that it probably wouldn't pull in the amount of money that I really need to get it going. Um, I think, you know, I'll probably get a few grand or something, but like, you know, my mortgage is way, way more. So if I thought it would have been successful, I probably would have done it. Um, if you are an expert in, in crowdfund, crowdfunding running, uh, please ping me. But good question. Anyone else? You're all shy. Um, so hopefully, yeah, uh, Mr. Felix. No, no, no. We need we need lambdas for MVP, and hopefully I'm at MVP by next year. In one year, MVP including lambdas. I hope. If not, I, I'm going to be really sad. Yeah, that's, that's a big, big Well, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that it's it's so close, eh? There's just maybe a few scattered bugs and lambdas. It's so close, uh, and then I could literally you know deploy a Ceph cluster from scratch or something like on the stage, or, you know, ping me your use case that you want to see. Pick really hard automated distributed systems problem. Like every tool today in infrastructure, declarative, configuration management, etc., they're all about building the cluster to the point in time, day one, and there's no day two story. There's no good day two story. The day two story is what we're trying to solve first. We solve the day two story, you get day one for free. Huh? Sneaky, but it works. Uh, it will work. Uh, there's just no other way, because everyone who sets up their infrastructure, and then they go away and it rots. It should self-manage itself. It should, it should look at the stream of uh, output states from RAID and say, oh, the state is okay, the RAID is healthy, RAID is healthy, RAID is healthy. Oh, RAID is unhealthy, instantly it's replacing disks, right? You should not have an alert that then emails you, that you get paid, you wake up, you go to the computer, and then you start doing some RAID stuff. All this has to be autonomous. There's no way to do this. Uh, the future of infrastructure will be autonomous. Uh, the question is, is MGMT going to build it, or is someone else going to build something else? And hopefully it's built in an elegant way. Um, because Kubernetes is not solving this problem. And I think you all know that. Right? Um, more questions? Just ranty, sorry. <laughs> I kind of like, I really like kind of having these like deep technical ranty talks. Like let's argue together, I have fun doing it. So uh, don't be shy, come up to me uh, at the beverage center or at the conference, I'm happy to talk to you. Yeah, the gentleman over here with the Ansible shirt. <laughs> the, the question would be, why a CD? Well, I mean, why would you um, have this um, well, distributed lock and all these kind of things, yeah. where a 
at the end, all the things that are happening in terms of reconciliation is happening on the node. Okay, great question. So the gentleman roughly asked, correct me, uh, why is etcd involved here? We care about things on the node. Um, and you know, why, why group these things together? So etcd is, etcd doesn't have to be etcd, I just chose raft algorithm and you need an implementation in Golang because I want this to all be native and I decided etcd is, is the best choice. The reason it's important is because we don't want a central point of coordination. We don't want a puppet master or what have you. Uh, because if you do, you have a single point of failure and it's just annoying and architecturally it's cooler to have just a distributed bunch of random nodes that come and go. So we push our code into that cluster. The cluster knows how to get the code via etcd to everywhere uh, that it needs to be. And each node is basically running um, a, dis uh, a distributed algorithm. But the, the cool thing is single node problems are not that interesting. We care about what the other nodes are doing. And so we need some sort of way to exchange information about, hi, um, we're four nodes that happen to be alive and in this cluster, okay, we're all at ground state. And then each node knows that it's supposed to be, say, a cluster FS server. So they all each individually uh, install the packages. And when they're ready for step two, which might be to start the service, they say, oh, we're all in state one, we can see everyone else is in state one, then we all individually start the service. Um, then after that, we know we're ready to create a volume. Or the load balancer knows about all the web servers that come up and go. So we need a place to exchange and communicate data, and we use etcd. Now here's a really important point that most people don't realize about MGMT. In contrast with other tools that store data in etcd, Kubernetes, um, we don't have any of the important data that's in Kubernetes, uh, that's in etcd. All of the data that we put into etcd is generated <coughs> as a result of the MCL code that runs on each node. So you don't need to back up the data in etcd. In fact, if for some reason you screw up and your etcd cluster dies, that's okay. You just uh, start up a new one. All the nodes will have to recalculate all that data and push it in there to tell etcd again what their state is, but that all happens automatically. So it's just a medium for exchange. And as a result of that, um, and, and a second point, as a result of only sending the minimal amount of inter information that's need, needed for uh, coordination, the uh, use of etcd is extremely low. So we can scale well above 10,000 etcd hosts, like 100,000 range probably, and if we wanted to optimize it, probably a lot higher. I'm not making any promises, but my rough envelope calculations are pretty clear that like, this is not a, a bottleneck at all. Um, and if you're in the million node range, you can have to pay me for consulting. And I'll tell you how to fix that problem next. So, um, yeah, does that answer your question? You can, you can debate and follow up if you want, this is cool. I have a lot of voice, but you can scream. We can discuss that later. Yeah, happy to discuss. Um, any other questions? Uh, if you don't have questions, I can pick on people. Like, what's your question? What's their conversation about? It looks intimate. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyone else? I mean, well, but we Jeez. wanted to want it still be painful, like your etcd dies and, and get, everything gets repopulated, but, but the nodes then see, oh, the, the data is incomplete, I have to go into action, I have to rerun all these resources. Ah. Yeah, so uh, Felix asks, like, won't this be painful? So the truth is, uh, the status quo today is that your etcd cluster should always stay alive, right? Like if you take any Kubernetes user and you nuke their entire etcd cluster, they're going to say, oh my god, data loss, go to backups, right? That's true? It's, I think it's true. I don't run Kubernetes anymore, but like, I'm pretty sure that's true. So we're giving you a better standard. We're saying um, etcd is there. We're going to autonomously manage it for you so that it probably never breaks. Uh, basically, the rule of thumb is the rate at which you add new hosts into your cluster must be greater at which, uh, greater than the rate at which the hosts go on fire. So imagine you're adding hosts two per minute and you're deleting one one per minute, you're okay. If you're deleting at three per minute, eventually you'll run out of hosts. And uh, Raft and Paxos like, make no guarantees that the cluster can't die. But um, that's a reasonable assumption. That's how every cluster in the world works. You nuke all the clusters in the world at once, no raft of access is ever going to save you. So as long as we do that, MGMT will do that automation, that automatically adding new hosts into the cluster, the etcd cluster will stay alive. But your disaster recovery scenario is you don't have to have a backup. You just have to wait an extra minute 
the first time your cluster starts up again. That's like, that's golden. Who cares, right? Latency with Puppet is every 30 minutes. We're saying once you have a disaster recovery scenario, your latency is one minute instead of one second. I think we're in good space here. So um, yeah, that's how I see the world. Any other questions? You can ask me hard questions if you want. We can look at code, whatever you want. I'm here to hack for you. Hey, Marcel. Is that Marcel in the back? Hey, Marcel. We still need to talk about uh, higher level data configuration to go into the language. That's an open question. Um, could be interesting. Would you uh, mind explaining that? Uh, yeah, actually, if you want, sure. Uh, the gentleman asked if I'd explain that. So um, who's familiar with Puppet? Just raise your hand. So early Puppet, uh, to which I was a party of. So first we had Puppet, and then you know we had like uh, you know a resource that took a list of content or package names or whatever. And then suddenly we had, so let me, sorry, let me back up and clarify that. Let's say you just had a simple package resource, package, foo, state, present, or whatever it is. Uh, but then you realized, huh, I want to get the name of the package from, say, a config file, some YAML file, or whatever thing. So Puppet had these functions early on called, like, get variable, or what was, what was it called? Anyone remember? XLOOKUP. XLOOKUP or something, yeah, some, something like this. Basically, you gave it, it's just a function in Puppet. Um, you would give it a key name and it would pull the value from a text file database or something. And so then what happened is you had your code littered with all these like, get look up, look up, look up all over the place to pull in the data that ends up configuring the little niche parts of your code, right? Um, and this was a big mess, a big mess. And, um, and then someone came along, I forget if it was Ari or what, was it Ari? Who came up with this hero thing. And I have to say, um, with a few exceptions, I think it was probably the most brilliant part of Puppet because the structure of this YAML data file uh, just got squished on top like Python MRO style on top of your classes and stuff and it was really beautiful. The whole like dependency lookup order stuff was a huge mess and a mistake, uh, or parts of it anyways. I gave a talk about this, uh, or maybe it's on my blog. The data in modules, I think it was what it was called, part was brilliant. The original hero was not, the data in module stuff was brilliant, and I love that. And that really solved this data problem for Puppet. Now the problem is different in MGMT because we do not have a static, and that's the problem with Puppet, a static, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, those things that XML has, uh, the schema. schema, thank you. We do not have a static schema the way Puppet does. You guys are smart, eh? Someone rolled their eyes, they were like, schema? How did they think of schema? How did you know he was talking about schema? We don't have a static schema. Puppet, you know, a snapshot of Puppet code is effectively a static schema. And that's cool for Hira, but the fundamental model of the universe in MGMT is that your schemas, well, or the, the code that would have been the schema if we were doing a parallel to Puppet is changing over time. So that Hira model of a static schema doesn't really work for the interesting use cases. For the other use cases, it can. And so, um, at least for V1, we're actually going to have a real-time implementation of basically the, the get lookup for those things. Um, and that will be a bit yucky at first. Um, I have some ideas for what V2 would look like, and you know, let's say what the higher of MGMT would be, but that's still an unsolved problem. That's still an open discussion. Um, I'm not too worried about it, but there's work that hasn't been done yet. Um, and um, hopefully I'll be able to talk to you about how all that should look, because it's super exciting. That's super, super exciting. And if we solve this problem in MGMT, we solve it for all, a whole bunch of other people. Um, Marcel, uh, the QLang author in the back there, he's a very smart guy. I'm gonna, can I, can I poke fun at you on stage? <laughs> Marcel is a super smart guy, too smart, possibly. Um, not in a bad way. Uh, but he has not put in the time to learn the MGMT core fundamentals and basics. But I suspect, but he knows about Q, and I know there's a lot of smart stuff in Q that, to be honest, I haven't spent the time to learn either. But when we both spend the time to learn how each other's stuff works, I think there's a good chance we come up with something amazing. Um, and if that happens, we're going to see. Um, I don't know. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Um, but there's. There's so much innovation still to do in this field. There's you know years, possibly decades of innovation still to do, um, so that we can eventually go home and have a you know autonomous distributed home cluster if we want, or something else. Um, I think.
think I'm good for time. So thank you so much. Round of applause for Walter.